In previous videos, we walked through flat engraving and embossing on the x F1 Ultra. And in this video, we're gonna be doing a deep dive into processing round work pieces with the F1 Ultra and the RE2 Pro Rotary module. Now, I've got a lot of different work pieces and test graphics for us to get through. So naturally, we are gonna run into some challenges along the way, but not to worry, we're gonna solve all of those together. I've even got new upgrades for the F1 Ultra as well as the RE2 Rotary module. And towards the end of the video, I'll even show you guys how to process some round work pieces without the use of the RE2 Pro Rotary module. So be sure to watch right to the end. We've got a lot of stuff to get through. Let's go. This is the RE2 Pro, and you can see that I have it assembled in chuck mode. You can see that there's one extra gray piece there. We'll get to that in a minute, but otherwise this is the standard RE2 kit in chuck mode. And I'm gonna line it up here on the F1 Ultra base plate. On the base plate, there are two alignment marks that you would normally line up the front edge of the RE2 base with. And this would ensure that the rotating axis of your workpiece is in line with the center of the machine. Now, one of the issues here is that if you have a very long workpiece and you wanna get more of that inside of the workable area of the F1 Ultra, you would need to pull this entire RE2 mechanism backwards. Now the RE2 base is really only in contact with one of these notches and the other one, you're going to have to do a little bit of guesswork. Now, at the time of this video, there's somewhat limited information on how this is supposed to work with the F1 Ultra, but from what I can tell, it seems to be intended to be used with the rollers. And with the rollers, you wouldn't have to pull the whole RE2 back to fit larger pieces in. But if you guys have worked with circular work pieces before, you'll know that the chuck is much more flexible than the rollers, because of course with the rollers, you would never be able to engrave things with handles. Objects with handles would not be able to rotate continuously on the rollers as they would hit, and it's also the case here with the standard RA2 kit, the handles oftentimes hit the bottom base. And this is even more so the case with much larger work pieces like these 40 ounce tumblers and water bottles that are very popular right now. There's absolutely no chance this thing is rotating all around and you'll definitely have to pull that thing back to get the entire water bottle or tumbler to fit inside of the workable area. The other challenge that you'll run into is working with tapered tumblers and mugs. These are very challenging to do with the rollers. Once you start rolling the tapered surface on the rollers, it'll want to walk down the rollers and move. And even here on the chuck, the tapered surface is not parallel with the machine, and this is going to skew your graphic or image. Therefore, if you want to use the RE2 with the F1 Ultra to process the widest variety of round work pieces, I've got a solution for you. If you guys have watched my videos about the Xtool D1 Pro, as well as the regular F1, you might be familiar with my tilt mechanism kits, and I've got one here specifically for the F1 Ultra. Right now you're looking at what's included with this kit, and I'm going to walk you guys through how to assemble it on your RA2, and then we'll go through all of the examples, and I'll show you how it's going to solve all of those aforementioned problems. And so the very first thing we need to do here is some minor disassembly of your RA2. And at the back of the entire RA2 mechanism, there are these two long M3 button head cap screws, and you're going to want to pull them out and put them aside and keep them because we're gonna need them in the next step here. We're going to be attaching the entire RA2 rotary chuck module to the tilt mechanism body. There's a marking on the tilt body that says chuck side, and you're gonna line that up with the chuck side of the RA2 body. And you're going to be reusing the exact same holes that you pulled those long M3 button head cap screws out of. And you're going to be lining those up with the holes on the tilt body. The long M3 screws go through and they should pass all the way to the other side and you can tighten them down. If you're finding that the screws are a little tight to get through, there is a large M5 socket head cap screw on this side of the tilt body, so it's the upper one, that you can give a quarter turn. You don't wanna completely loosen it off. You don't wanna go more than a half turn, just maybe a quarter turn, and that'll loosen up those rotating arms and give you a little more slack to get the long M3 screws through. However, in most circumstances, you shouldn't have to adjust that M5 screw, but I just wanted to bring that to your attention, just in case. Since we normally don't have to make any adjustments to that upper M5 screw, it's the lower one that is going to enable us to tilt the entire RE2 body. And again, you shouldn't really have to touch that upper one. And one other friendly reminder, those M3s at the back, 
you don't need to over tighten them either, just get them snug. Now we need to get that entire assembly mounted onto the original RA2 base and inside of the tilt hardware kit, you'll find these small M3 square nuts and they'll slide directly into the channels on the RA2 base and I would recommend you doing it from this side of the base here where you can seat them flat on this surface and then you can just draw them in with a screwdriver or an Allen key. Now they are intended to be a fairly snug fit inside of the channel so they don't rotate. So if you're having a hard time getting them in there, try flipping them upside down if they won't fit in one direction. Inside the hardware kit, you'll also find four M3 by 10 socket head cap screws and washers. And this is what we're going to use to mount this assembly to the RA2 base. And those M3 socket head cap screws will thread into the M3 square nuts. At this point in the assembly, you'll just want to start threading them and you don't necessarily want to tighten them all the way down because we're going to want to make some adjustments to the position of the rotary module on top of the RA2 base later in this setup. So at this point, this is what your assembly should look like and note that the chuck is facing the chuck side on the tilt body where there's that text and it's facing those notches in the RA2 base. This is very important because that RA2 base is asymmetrical. Now I'm going to temporarily give those M3s a half turn to lock them down onto the base so this thing doesn't slide around and demonstrate how it's supposed to look when it's tightened down. When looking at this assembly with the chuck on the left hand side, the edges of the RA2 tilt mechanism will line up with the edges of the RA2 base. So this face here will line up with this face of the RA2 base. And if you're not entirely confident in getting these things lined up by hand or eye, you can use a speed square as I was just showing in this clip. And one other little upgrade that I've got here that is separate from the tilt kit, but I do find makes life so much easier when doing these round tumblers is the backstop and bubble level kit. And this is that gray piece that I pointed out earlier in this video. So this is the backstop and you can see that I just got to remove the chuck jaws from the RA2, slide on the backstop and put the chuck jaws back on top. And now with both the tilt mechanism and the backstop installed, you can see how quickly you can set up a tapered tumbler. So you can get the tumbler on top of the RA2 chuck jaws. You can butt it up right against the backstop so you'll know that it's going to rotate perfectly along the RA2's center axis. We can tighten it up and now we can find the perfect angle for our tapered tumbler and we can use the bubble level holder that comes with the backstop kit and that will line up the bubble level perfectly along the axis of rotation of our workpiece. And then we can tighten down the one screw at the bottom of our tilt mechanism kit. And our tumbler is now perfectly aligned with the machine and it's ready to be processed. Switching over to a workpiece that's not tapered, but does have a handle that would have previously hit the RA2 base. You can see that I've got the level on there indicating that the surface of this mug is level and I've tightened down the tilt kit in the level position and you can see the tilt kit adds some height so now the handle no longer hits the base. So now you can see the tilt mechanism kit has already solved a few of our problems but let's see how the rest of the pieces work with the F1 Ultra to solve the remainder of the problems. So in the kit we've got this next piece here which I call the RA2 mount and there will be four of these M4 by 10 socket head cap screws and you're going to secure the mount on the right hand side of the F1 Ultra with those four screws in the center most position. And then you've got this other piece here which I call the RA2 support and you'll find two more M3 by 10 socket head cap screws that go into the back of this support piece. If you take the RA2 base plate and you place it inside of that RA2 support, that's gonna center it on top of the F1 Ultra base plate, but the back can overhang if you need to slide the RE2 really far to the right hand side. So we're gonna take that support piece and we're gonna screw that into the right hand side of the back of the RE2 base plate. And now it's going to support the entire plate as you pull it away from the center of the F1 Ultra. It will no longer want to tip over. And now you have an incredible amount of flexibility where you can easily quickly move the entire RE2 in base plate left and right and you can loosen off those four M3 socket head cap screws that are holding the tilt mechanism down to the RA2 base plate. 
and slide that along the plate as well. So now we've got a ton of flexibility to work with a huge variety of work pieces, and there's even a few more tricks this thing's got. If you keep watching this video, I'll walk you guys through that. But for now, we're gonna set up one of these very large 40 ounce tumblers with a handle. And the first thing I'm gonna do is snug down that lower M5 cap screw on the tilt mechanism, just to make sure that the RE2 isn't going to flop around under the weight of this very large 40 ounce tumbler. I'll use the jaws to grab the inside of this workpiece, and then I'll rotate it around to make sure that the handle clears the base plate. Next, I need to make sure that the surface that I want to engrave is level with respect to the machine. The RE2 comes with this small bubble level, and again, I'm gonna be using the bubble level holder that comes with the backstop kit, and I'll be placing that on top of the surface that I want to engrave. And I can loosen off that lower M5 socket head, and this is going to allow me to lift the tumbler to get that surface I want to engrave level with the machine, and I'm gonna be using the RA2 steady rest to help me do this. These 40 ounce tumblers are extremely large, and they're pretty heavy, and they could slip out of the chuck jaws of the RA2, so I like having the other end of the workpiece supported with the steady rest. Once the surface is level, I'll tighten down that lower M5 socket head to lock the tilt mechanism in place, and then I'll use the up and down buttons on the F1 Ultra controller to get that surface in focus. Now we can slide this whole thing around in order to get the surface that we want to engrave centered within the work area of the F1 Ultra. Once I'm happy with the final position, I can plug the RA2 module into the side of the F1 Ultra using the USB cable. Xtool has gone with what appears to be some kind of proprietary USB style connector, and I'm gonna plug that into the topmost accessory plug on the side of the F1 Ultra. Now that we've got our physical setup done, let's take a look at the digital setup inside of Xtool Creative Space. I've got the F1 Ultra connected. I'm gonna switch over to rotary mode on the right hand side, I'm also gonna click on Chuck since we're in the Chuck configuration. And in the diameter box, I'm gonna type in 100 millimeters as the outer diameter of my tumbler. I've also clicked on the camera refresh button to get a snapshot of our workspace. And you can see there's a green line that goes across the workspace and there is an arrow that indicates the axis of rotation and the direction of rotation of which our tumbler is going to rotate once we process an image. Using the image button on the left hand side, I'll bring in my logo. This is a vector logo and I've got a few extra elements in there, those circles that I no longer want for this particular example. So I can go into the object list, select those circles and just delete them. And you can see all of the other elements inside of this vector file are grouped together. Then in the easy set panel, I can click on engrave and that's gonna fill in the enclosed vector shapes. And I'm gonna rotate my design 90 degrees so that it lines up with the direction of my workpiece. For this example, I also wanna add a little bit of text. So I'll grab the text tool, I'll type in the name of this channel, Embrace Making, and I'm going to select that text. I can change the font. Xtool Creative Space has some built-in fonts, but you can also select from your system fonts. And then I'll change the size, I'll rotate it 90 degrees, and I'm going to line it up with my logo. And then I can select both of these things, right-click them on the object list, and group them together. Now with the group selected, I can use the arrow keys on my keyboard to move the group around and make any fine adjustments to its position. And in order to get some feeling for how big this logo is going to be on the tumbler, I'm gonna use this measuring tape to measure out seven centimeters or about 70 millimeters. And I'll resize my graphic to that size and I'll bring it right up to that green axis of rotation line. You cannot put any graphics north or above that line. Otherwise, the Creative Space software will warn you that it can't be processed. Now that the graphic is in place, we've got to deal with the material settings itself. So if I click on the user defined material in the top right hand corner and head on into the material easy set library, I can filter by metal and I can scroll through the different options and try and find a tumbler with a similar color. And I found this sea foam colored tumbler and you can see here that I've got the rotary attachment selected. I'm gonna select on engrave as the process type and I'm gonna be starting with the blue laser. So I'm gonna open those settings in Xtool Creative Space. And just be careful because even though I selected 
the blue light laser inside of the material easy set library once I got back into the workspace here, it was still defaulting back to the fiber IR laser settings. So you're going to want to double check that you're still in blue light mode. And you'll also notice that the diameter of the workpiece was reset to zero. So I'll have to re-enter the 100 millimeter diameter measurement. And then I can click on the framing button and it will frame that using the blue light laser on my workpiece. Now with everything set up to my liking, I'll click on the process button. I'll lower the shield of the F1 Ultra, but of course you can't get it around the entire workpiece. So it's absolutely critical that you wear some sort of eye protection. I've got these great laser goggles on my website, embracemaking.com that work with both blue light and infrared light. So I'm gonna put those on. I'll click the button on the front of the F1 Ultra and this job will get started. A few minutes later, this is the result, but I'm not going to touch it. I do not want to disturb it. And that's because I'm going to give it a second pass with the IR laser. This two pass process, first with the blue light, then second with the IR laser is something that I showed in the previous regular F1 video. And the fiber IR laser does a really nice job of cleaning up and exposing the stainless steel material underneath of the area the blue light laser processed. And if you get the settings just right, it looks phenomenal. However, this is my first attempt with these seafoam color tumblers, and I'm using the default settings inside of Xtool Creative Space. So these might not be the exact tumblers that Xtool uses. Oftentimes the paint or powder coat on the outside of these tumblers and water bottles can be thin or thick depending on the vendor that you get them from. And this is gonna make a big difference on your material settings. And in this case, I can already see that the paint is pretty thin on these ones that I have. And that stainless material is looking over-processed, a little bit blue and dark. So I definitely hit that with too much power. If you're working with a new workpiece, you're likely going to want to budget to have at least one workpiece that you're gonna to sacrifice to dialing in your settings. So I'm gonna flip this tumbler around and you can see the bottom portion of this 40 ounce tumbler is actually tapered. So we're gonna set this thing up like a tapered tumbler. So I've got it back in the chuck jaws. I'm gonna tighten those down. Don't tighten them too tight because sometimes that actually makes the tumblers and mugs slip out faster, just snug. Then I'm gonna loosen off the bottom M5 bolt on the tilt mechanism. I've got the large side of the mug set up in the steady rest. And I'm gonna to begin to tilt the whole thing down and get that tapered surface level with respect to the machine. And one other tip before starting your job, always rotate your workpiece around by hand. Make sure it's not going to wobble or fall out of those chuck jaws. Now back in Xtool Creative Space, I'm gonna grab this much more recognizable logo and I'm going to trace it out and turn it into a vector because it was just a raster image. When you're inside of the trace image tool, you're gonna to play around with these sliders and you're going to want to try and avoid getting any sort of double lines on your image. You should just have nice tight lines that outline the image that you wanna trace. Black and white images work the best. And once you're happy with the result and you've accepted it, don't forget to go back into the object list and disable, delete, or remove and hide the original raster image because it doesn't do that by default. So now all we're left with here is the vector image. Then I can refresh the camera preview and you can see how I've got the tumbler flipped around and I'm going to resize and reposition this logo. And while I'm doing that, I'll just make this disclaimer that I put in all of my videos. I like to use these recognizable logos for fun. I am not in the business of selling or trying to recreate any sort of branded material. And I would highly recommend that you also do not sell items with trademarked or copyrighted logos, of course, unless you have the license to do so. And with that out of the way, now we're ready to experiment with some new settings on this logo. So I'm going to select that and we're going to select the blue light laser again. And I'm gonna dial back the power to 35%. I'm also going to change the speed so I'm gonna increase the speed to 400 millimeters per second, and that's the fastest that we can process using the RA2, and I increase the lines per centimeter to 300. 
And one silly mistake that I make here before we get started is I forget to change the diameter of this job. So I've still got it set to 100 millimeters, which is the larger side of this tumbler. And I should have changed that to about 75 millimeters instead. And because I made this error, you'll notice that the height to width ratio of the logo is going to look off. But for now, we'll just run with it because it's a test piece. So again, I'll refresh the camera view. I have not touched the tumbler whatsoever because we're gonna do this second pass with the fiber IR laser with some new settings. So this time 20% power, 400 millimeters per second speed. And we're gonna keep the lines per centimeter at 300. The frequency is gonna remain at 30 kilohertz. As I'm watching this job get processed through the protective lens, I can tell immediately that these settings are already looking quite a bit better. And once the job is done, taking a closer look at the result definitely validates these new settings for these seafoam tumblers with fairly thin paint. The stainless steel is looking nice and bright and you can't really see any lines that have been imparted on the metal from either the blue light or the fiber laser compared to the original settings you can see that it is a huge improvement. So now we're gonna flip this tumbler over to the other side and we're going to rerun this entire job with the new settings. And since we already set this thing up once, I'm not gonna walk through that whole process all over again. I'll just repeat the settings. So for the blue light laser, we've got 35% power, 400 millimeters per second, 300 lines per centimeter. Now, since this is still a test tumbler with the fiber IR cleanup pass, I'm gonna do a slight experiment here. I'm gonna dial the power back even further to 15% power at 400 millimeters per second. I'll keep the lines per centimeter at 300 lines per centimeter and 30 kilohertz on the frequency. And we'll take a look at the result. And after pulling the tumbler out, one of the first things that I noticed is actually a slight drop shadow on the graphic. Now this might look a little bit cool, but what this tells me is that this tumbler and its handle is pretty heavy and large that in between the blue light and fiber IR laser jobs, the weight of the handle might have shifted the tumbler ever so slightly before the cleanup pass on the IR laser. And that's because the F1 Ultra doesn't keep that motor engaged in between jobs, so it's free to spin. So that's something to be aware of with workpieces with big handles. And the other thing with this lower power setting is I found the edges weren't as crisp. So this time it's another lesson learned in the pursuit of finding the optimal settings for these tumblers. But at least for that sacrificial workpiece, we got some experience setting these things up. Now, one thing you may have noticed during that setup is that when I went to focus on the surface of these 100 millimeter tumblers, we're getting real close to the upper limit of travel for the F1 Ultra. And because of that, my tilt mechanism kit has one more trick up its sleeve to deal with these larger diameter workpieces. And so you can completely remove the whole assembly from the RA2 base and you can thread it directly into the top of the RA2 mount piece. There are four brass threads directly integrated into that mount piece and you can use those M3 screws to screw it right down. Now we've gained back the thickness of the RA2 base plate and the next thing I'm gonna do here is I'm gonna apply some painter's tape to the faces of this 40 ounce tumbler. And this is a method that I like to use to help me visualize where those graphics are gonna be if I'm going to engrave a graphic on the top half of this tumbler and on the bottom half and I want them to line up. If this tumbler was one uniform profile, I could do it in one setup, but because it's broken up into two different diameters and the bottom half is even tapered, I can't do that. Now, one thing to be aware of though, if you take the assembly off of the RA2 base and you've got one of these very large tumblers with a wide handle, it still might come pretty close or even hit the base. Now, my design is still going to work because I don't need to rotate the tumbler around far enough for the handle to hit the base, but it's just something to be aware of. Again, I'm trying to provide you guys with the most amount of flexibility and work pieces that we can process, but inevitably you may still run into a situation where you're going to have to make some compromises. On this royal blue colored workpiece, I think this logo is going to look quite nice. And I've sized the width such that it should fit between those tape lines with a little bit of space on either side. And you can see that with the camera preview refreshed, 
I've got my tape line lined up with the center axis of rotation, that green line within Xtool Creative Space. And you can also see that this time the thickness is showing up at 144 millimeters. So that's with the laser focused on that top surface. And if you remember from the previous example, it was pretty much at the upper limit, which was 150 millimeters. So now we've got a comfortable amount of space in terms of leeway for our focus. And from the lessons learned from our previous sacrificial workpiece, we're going to reuse the same blue light laser settings. So 35% power, 400 millimeters per second, 300 lines per centimeter. And we're going to continue to use those settings despite this tumbler being a slightly different color. Before starting this job, I'll use the framing feature to make sure that the laser projection is taking place centered in between those two tape lines. And when I'm happy with the position, I can go ahead and start the job. I really like having the tape lines as a visual reference to where that graphic is going to be placed instead of completely eyeballing it blind. Once the blue light laser pass is complete, we're going to switch back again to the fiber IR laser. And this time around, we're going to use 20% power, 400 millimeters per second, 300 lines per centimeter, and leave the frequency at 30 kilohertz. And these here are the final settings that I've settled on for this style of tumbler, and I'll put a link to these down in the video description below if you want to order some of these at a pretty reasonable price. And now that you have some baseline settings to work with for these particular tumblers, you've got a really nice starting point, so it doesn't matter if you've got the seafoam color or these royal blue ones, or pretty much any other color, you can start with those settings and hopefully minimize the number of test pieces you have to sacrifice. So now we're going to process the bottom side of this tumbler. And again, with those tape lines, we've got a nice visual reference to where we're going to place that graphic. And again, I'm not going to walk through the setup because we've covered that in the previous example of the exact same tumbler that was the seafoam color. But this second time around, I'm going to point out that I'm not going to make the same mistake as the first time. And I'm going to use that 75 millimeter diameter for the smaller bottom section of these tumblers. This should result in the proper aspect ratio of the graphic once we engrave it. And you'll see that I'm using the now familiar to us settings for the blue light laser for the first pass, 35% power, 400 millimeters per second, 300 lines per centimeter. I'll make some final minor adjustments to the graphic position. I'll get it framed up and then we'll process this job. And now that we're all familiar with this two-step blue light fiber IR laser process, just only take a very quick peek at the blue light laser running, hop back into Xtool Creative Space, and switch back to the IR laser. Now there will be some of you who are skipping around through this video, so I will always repeat myself when it comes to the settings. So for the fiber IR laser, it's 20% power, 400 millimeters per second, 300 lines per centimeter at 30 kilohertz. And for those of you guys who do have an incredible attention span and watch these videos from start to finish and really appreciate this thorough content, I would love if you guys hit that subscribe button. Once the job is done, we can take a look at the result and you can see I did get the logo in between those tape lines, but the placement could be improved a little bit, maybe next time. At least the graphic itself looks really nice and that stainless is bright and really pops against that royal blue color. You can also see that the aspect ratio of the graphic is now correct and on that lower surface it was tapered but because of the tilt mechanism it wasn't at all skewed and it was super easy and quick to set up. And with the tape lines removed it's a little less obvious that there's a slight misalignment between those two graphics especially considering how far apart they are. Even still I think the alignment is better than it would have been had I had not used those tape lines. Now, even though that previous example did have a tapered surface, if you watch any of my videos, you know I do like to be very thorough. So we'll look at a specific example here of one of these wine tumblers where most of the surface is tapered. You'll notice that it's much shorter than those 40 ounce tumblers in the back. So I'm not gonna be using the steady rest for this example. And I've got it set up with those chuck jaws, grabbing the inside of this wine tumbler. They're also a much smaller diameter at about 86 millimeters at the middle of that tapered surface. So I've got the tilt mechanism mounted back on the RA2 base plate. The F1 Ultra has more than enough height to comfortably focus in on the top 
of these wine tumblers. So see that I've refreshed the camera view and I've got the focus in. So the height here is 139 millimeters. And I'm gonna take this graphic, which I think is very suitable for a pink wine tumbler. And I'm going to resize it and position it onto that tapered surface of the wine tumbler. In my other rotary video with the regular X-Tool F1, I did this exact example with the same colored tumbler. So I'm very familiar with this material. These specific wine tumblers have a very thin coating of paint, so I'm going to dial down the settings a little bit. I'm going to take the blue light down to 30% power, 400 millimeters per second, 300 lines per centimeter, and this is going to be the first pass. As per usual, before I start the job, I'll use the framing tool to frame the graphic on the workpiece and just make sure that I have it sized correctly so it all falls on top of that tapered surface. In the first pass of the blue light laser, you can see that the pink paint starts to turn a dark gray color and these initial settings are looking very promising so far. Once you start using a lot of the same materials, you get a pretty good feel for how you can make some intuitive adjustments to these settings such that you won't have to perform a lot of test engravings. Now for the second pass with the fiber IR laser, I'm gonna go back to the settings that we previously did at 20% power, 400 millimeters per second, 300 lines per centimeter, and I'm gonna leave the frequency at 30 kilohertz. These much smaller wine tumblers do not have large handles, and they're not nearly at the same risk of rotating under their own weight between the two passes. So as long as we don't touch the wine tumbler in between the two passes, we shouldn't see any misalignment between the blue and fiber processes. And we should end up with a really nice sharp looking graphic. And if you guys are wondering after the job is done, I'm usually cleaning these things off with some 70% isopropyl alcohol. And looking at the final results, I'm really happy with the way this one turned out. It's definitely on par with the same results that I achieved with the regular X-Tool F1 in my previous RA2 video. And speaking of previous videos, I somewhat recently did a video outlining all of the details on how to perform a full wrap engrave on these water bottles. Now this example here is not tapered, it's a straight surface. In the previous video, I also showed you guys how to do full wrap engraves on tapered surfaces, as well as some other really cool tips and tricks. So I would encourage you to go check out that video at the link above, I'll put that in the top right hand corner of the screen, because I'll go through the entire process of designing and setting up that graphic for the full wrap engrave. In this video, I'm just gonna cut to the chase and I'm going to import the full wrap graphic and it's absolutely critical that we do not resize it. It has already been carefully designed and sized for this workpiece. The only thing I'm going to do is just rotate it so the graphic is in the proper orientation for the water bottle. And for these full wrap engraves, the other thing I'm gonna do here is I'm going to align the graphic as close as I can to the center axis of rotation. And when you have your graphics selected in Xtool Creative Space, you can use the arrows on your keyboard to make small incremental changes to the position of that graphic. And it's much easier to do it this way than it is to click on it and drag it around with your mouse. Now, one other thing you may also notice here is that the graphic of these palm trees has a blue background. Now this blue square is going to help us with the framing process. And this is something that I go a little more in depth with explaining in that previous full wrap engrave video. But for now, just know that it's gonna help us with the framing. So right now I'm gonna select all of the graphics just by pressing Control A on the keyboard. Then I can adjust the blue light laser settings and I'm gonna go again with 30% power, 400 millimeters per second, 300 lines per centimeter, and we'll get this framed. And during the framing process, if you look very carefully, because of that large blue rectangle, which is going to help us center our graphic, the laser line projected onto the water bottle covers that entire blue area. While we're framing that graphic, it's part of the design, and it helps me visualize better how those palm trees are gonna get centered onto the water bottle. But of course, I don't actually want to engrave that blue rectangle, so I'm gonna find it in the object list and I'm going to either delete it or I can turn the output off and just make sure again that it's not going to be part of the process. Otherwise, we'd end up with just a giant rectangle engraved on our water bottle and that would definitely ruin things. 
So we'll get our first round of the palm tree pattern engraved on our pink water bottle. I'm shooting for a very fun tropical theme here. And one thing to note if you haven't done full wrap engraves before is that understandably there's a lot more to engrave. So you can expect that the process is gonna take quite a bit longer. A single pass on a water bottle could take up to about 10 minutes or so. If you're running a business, of course, you're going to have to factor that into the price. Now I'll switch over to the fiber laser for the cleanup pass, 20% power, 400 millimeters per second, 300 lines per centimeter, and we're still working at 30 kilohertz. And just a friendly reminder while this job is running, please wear laser safety goggles while you're doing this. The lid will not close over the RA2 module. I've got some really nice laser safety glasses on my website. It works with both the blue and IR lasers, so go check those out. And after a quick cleanup with the 70% IPA, I really like this design. I think it looks pretty good. And you can see with the full wrap engrave, there is not a point around the bottle where you can see where the pattern stops and starts. So that's a great success. Now I'm gonna do one more full wrap engrave. And you can see this time that it's a black water bottle and I'm gonna be using my logo. The setup is exactly the same as the previous round water bottle. None of the surfaces are tapered. The only difference here is that it's got a black powder coat and it's a slightly different diameter. The reason that I'm doing this second example is because of the type of coating it has. So that previous pink water bottle was more of a thinner paint coating and this one is a thicker powder coat. And sometimes the only way to find out is to mess up one water bottle. So in this case, I thought maybe the powder coat was thin enough that I could get away with that 30% power setting on the first pass with the blue light laser. And spoiler alert, because this first black water bottle is not going to turn out properly, I'm just gonna cut through all of the processing video clips and just show you on the second pass, again, I'm using those previous settings on the fiber laser, 20% power, 400 millimeters per second, 300 lines per centimeter, 30 kilohertz, and this here is the result. The logos are really under-processed. They're still looking kind of brown. It looks like I didn't even make my way completely through the black powder coating, and that's definitely not a residue that's going to get wiped off with the IPA. And so what I did was I ran this job a whole bunch more times on this sacrificial piece, and I just created bands around the water bottle with many different settings, trying to find a combination that got me a nice bright looking stainless steel result. It took me quite a few tries, but eventually I did find something that's going to look quite a bit better. And for those of you guys who are interested, I got this particular water bottle at Ikea. It's got a really cool lid, but I was just really pleasantly surprised with how thick that powder coating was. So I think that's going to be a very durable coating that won't chip off. So shout out to Ikea for a surprisingly good quality product. Now because of the thick powder coat, I'm gonna go with 50% power on the first pass with the blue light laser. All of the other settings are the same. And if you guys also pay close attention to the camera preview, this time you'll see that I've got my design flipped around 180 degrees. And that's because I flipped the water bottle around 180 degrees. The first time around I had the chuck draws trying to grab the outside of the water bottle on the bottom. And the bottom of these water bottles has too much of a radius edge, whereas the top, this time you can see that I'm actually processing it with the lid on, and the lid was perfect to grab on the outside with the chuck jaws. And so the takeaway here is that sometimes the lid can actually be useful for setting up your workpiece. Now this clip is from the previous example that didn't turn out quite right, but I want to do a quick aside and draw your attention to the fumes coming off of the workpiece. I have no idea what's in the paint or the powder coat, but I can almost guarantee you don't want to be breathing that in. On my website, I've got a lot of adapters that work with the Xtool machines to build your own fume extraction and filtration systems. For example, on the Xtool F1 Ultra, it comes with one of these black flexible hoses. Now this thing is about three inches in diameter, so I've got a three inch to four inch hose adapter. Now this one here allows you to splice the two hoses together to get to that more common four inch hose size, but I also have another one that plugs in directly to the back of the Xtool F1 Ultra to go right to four inch hose directly off the back of the machine. Then you can use a four inch inline duct fan like this one, which features a speed controller, and you can use that to 
push the exhaust fumes outside of your home or workspace. I'll put a link to this model in the video description down below. X-Tool also offers a six inch duct version and they include the four inch adapters. You can see that I've got mine routed outside of a custom panel that I set up in my basement window. And if you can't get these smoke and fumes outside, X-Tool also offers a filtration system. I'll put a link to that in the video description down below as well. And I've got flanged adapters that interface with the smoke and fume filtration system from X-Tool. So if you wanna be really sure that you're not going to be breathing in anything that might make it past the filtration system coming out the exhaust side, you can route that out another door or window. And I've also got an adapter to go from the three inch flexible X-Tool hose directly into the top of their smoke and fume extractor. Why their hose doesn't fit their own smoke and fume extractor, not really sure, but at least I've got a solution for that. And if you guys wanna monitor the air quality in your workshop, I'll put a link to that in the video description down below. With the safety talk now out of the way, we're on to the second pass on our black powder coated water bottle. And because this coating is quite thick, I'm gonna be using a setting of 35% power, 400 millimeters per second, 300 lines per centimeter. And I've also increased the frequency to 45 kilohertz. From my testing, I found that increasing the fiber IR laser frequency to 45 kilohertz resulted in a much smoother looking graphic. From my understanding, increasing the frequency doesn't increase the laser power. You're still working with the same amount of available power, but you're pulsing the laser faster and therefore each pulse actually gets a little less peak power from my understanding. I think this results in less visible scan lines. Feel free to pick apart my description of how that works in the comments section down below, but just know that with these settings, you'll get much nicer results on those thicker coatings. Next, we'll have a look at using the RE2 and the tilt mechanism to engrave the inside and outside of rings, starting with the insides of rings. I've removed the normal chuck jaws and I've replaced them with these grippers here, grabbing the outside of the ring, and I've got the tilt mechanism set up at a pretty steep angle because the laser has to shoot down and engrave the inside of the ring. Focusing the laser on the inside of the ring can be a little tricky because it's difficult to see where the blue and red dot are going to line up on that polished surface. So one of the things I do to make that a little bit easier is that I rotate one of the grippers to the bottom position and I move the ring a little bit left of the blue dot. Then as I bring the focus up, so the red dot moves towards the blue dot, I can track that position as it's moving up and then I can slide the whole assembly back over to the right so that the surface, the inside surface of the ring is lined up with the red and blue dot. Using the surface of that gripper to track the red dot makes this whole process so much easier and then I can make any final minor adjustments with the ring in the proper position. And one other very important thing that I want to point out here when you're engraving the insides of these rings is you want to tilt the whole ring upwards such that if you were to project a straight line up and down onto the inside surface of that ring, it's not at all going to be obstructed by the rest of the ring or the round heads of those grippers. If that surface is obstructed from above, then obviously the laser is not going to reach it and nothing's going to get engraved. The setup inside of X-Tool Creative Space is going to be pretty similar to the tumblers and water bottles. I'm going to set it up in rotary mode, set it to chuck. The inside diameter of my ring is 18 millimeters, and for the material, I've selected stainless steel ring, and then by toggling the up and down buttons on the F1 Ultra controller, you'll see the thickness come in, and that's just the focus height of the inside surface of that ring. Then I can refresh the snapshot preview, and you'll see the ring appears to be at an angle, but I can assure you that in reality, the ring is in there nice and straight, and that angle is just a product of camera perspective with the camera placement and the fact that the ring is lifted up at such a severe angle. Then I can use the text tool to add some text and I'll just put some sort of generic message in there that you might find inside of a ring. And I find with these rings that the appropriate text size is about six. And that should comfortably fit on the inside or outside of these stainless steel bands that are about four millimeters wide. If you have wider rings, then obviously you can get away with larger text. The critical part of this setup is to use the alignment tool to horizontally center the text. And that's because we've got the bottom of that ring completely in the center of the machine when it's lined up with the red and blue dot. 
Framing is going to be nearly impossible to see with your eye. You saw that I tried to use a piece of paper there to see the blue light a little better. And so you're gonna have to put a lot of trust into your setup. And the final thing to do here when you're working on the inside of rings is reflect that text vertically. If you do not reflect or mirror that text vertically, then when you go to check the results, you're gonna find that you've got the mirror image of the text. Don't forget to do that. Ask me how I know. Using these steps, I was able to get this ring done on the first try and the Xtool Creative Space Easy Set Material settings for the stainless steel rings worked out perfect. As you saw in the previous screen recording, inside of Xtool Creative Space, I was using the fiber IR reference and the text is sharp and readable. Now we're gonna engrave the outside of the ring. So we'll bring the grippers in nice and tight and we'll grab the inside of the ring. And because we're doing the inside, Nothing is going to obstruct our access to the outside of the ring. So we'll take the tilt mechanism and we'll bring the ring back down to a level position. Then we can slide the entire RA2 back such that the ring is aligned with the blue dot and adjust our focus so that the red dot and blue dot now meet on the top surface of that ring. Inside of Xtool Creative Space, I'm going to just change the text just for fun. And again, I'm going to ensure that the text is in the center position of the workspace. I have not moved it. I'm going to change the diameter to 22.3 millimeters because that's the outer diameter of the ring. And I'll just refresh the snapshot preview. And you can see that when the ring is not inclined at such a severe angle, there's no camera perspective issues playing tricks on you, making the ring look like it's on an angle. Then when we go to frame the job, Again, I'm using a strip of white printer paper just to try and get a better idea of where the blue laser projection is, but I'm very confident it should be lined up centered with the ring since the ring is centered and in Xtool Creative Space, the text was centered in the workspace. And just to reiterate on the outside of the ring, you do not need to reflect or mirror the text whatsoever. So if you're switching back and forth between engraving the insides and outsides of rings, just don't forget to reflect and unreflect that text. When working with round workpieces, there are ways to process them without rotating them at all. Earlier in the video, when I showed you the parts that come with my tilt mechanism, there was a gray piece that you may have recognized hasn't shown up in the video yet. And I'm gonna get to that now. So one of the things that we can do here is we can remove the entire tilt mechanism off of the RA2 base, and then we can remove the four M4 screws and remove the RE2 support piece off of the F1 Ultra base. Now what we're left with is just the tilt mechanism and the RE2 module. And we've got this gray piece here, it says chuck side on it. So you can imagine it's gonna be lined up with the chuck side of the RE2 and the tilt mechanism. And it's going to allow you to clamp this thing anywhere on that screw grid on the base plate of the F1 Ultra. And so what I'm doing here is I'm reusing the four M4 socket head cap screws from the RA2 support piece that we just removed. I pre-threaded them through the clamp piece and I'm going to just select the position towards the back of the F1 Ultra base plate. But just remember, I could have put this thing to the left, to the right, facing forwards, facing backwards, doesn't really matter. Those screws will line up with the grid pattern on the base of the F1 Ultra. And essentially what I'm doing here is I'm using the RA2 mechanism and that chuck to act as a workpiece holder, where in this case, we're gonna be engraving a round object, but the logo is small enough that we don't actually even need to rotate the cup to get this thing to work. So when we're in Xtool Creative Space, I have not selected using the rotary attachment. We're gonna be using the flat laser setup and these are plastic cups. So I'm gonna be using the fiber laser at 11% power, 400 millimeters per second speed, 80 lines per centimeter and 60 kilohertz frequency. And because we're in the flat laser mode, when you go to frame this object, obviously the cup is not at all going to rotate. And the reason you may want to process an object in this manner is because it's super fast and easy to set up. Without the object rotating while framing, it's extremely easy and accurate to plot out the position of a logo or graphic on a round surface. The second way of doing this is by using a V-block fixture. And a while back, I developed a whole bunch of these fixtures for the regular size F1, and then I made an adapter so you could transfer all of your F1 sized fixtures and jigs over to the F1 Ultra. 
So what I'll do here is I'll mount the F1 to F1 Ultra jig and fixture adapter to the F1 Ultra base plate. And you can see that it does not interfere with the RA2 mount piece. So you can have both mounted to the base plate of the F1 Ultra at the same time. Then I'll pop in the V-Block fixture. And in these throwback clips here from the F1 video, you can see how you can use the V-Block fixture with a variety of tumblers, mugs, and other round objects to set them up inside of the V-Block fixture. It's very quick, very easy. And by having this fixture and the RA2 tilt mechanism in your arsenal of tools, you can process most round objects very efficiently, switching back and forth between the two with minimal assembly and disassembly. More or less just have to pop out that V-Block fixture from the adapter and you're ready to go. One other detail here when we're processing round objects to take note of is when you're focusing the laser, don't focus it right on the top, focus it somewhere a little bit into the cup and that's because the surface is not rotating. You wanna try and split the difference between the highest point in the cup and the lowest point at which your graphic is going to sort of wrap around that round surface and reach. Now obviously you can only go so far down the sides of those cups before the laser falls out of focus. So there are limitations to doing this, but if you're not ready to invest in an RA2 rotary module, then this is a quick and cheap workaround for small logos on round objects. And in this example, again, I've got one of these plastic cups. So I'm using the fiber IR laser, 11% power, 400 millimeters per second, 80 lines per centimeter, 60 kilohertz on the frequency. And remember, you're going to have your work environment in process on flat surface, or what I like to call laser flat mode, Obviously, you can't have it in the rotary mode because nothing is going to be rotating your object. Then we can frame up our job, make any final adjustments to the position, send it off to the F1 Ultra, and very quickly process this job. And one final advantage to working with round objects this way is that you're not limited to the speed limitation using the RE2 module, which is 400 millimeters per second. You're working in laser flat mode, so you can hit the maximum speed. And one final thing I want to point out here about the V-Block fixture is that I do try and make all of my fixtures and tools multi-purpose so you get the most value out of them. It will hold up to nine standard size pencils and five of these aluminum bottle openers. I do my absolute best to make all of my tools and designs as flexible as possible so that in combination with these YouTube videos, you get the maximum amount of utility out of any of my tools. So head on over to embracemaking.com to find everything that you've seen in this video. So there it is, the F1 Ultra with the RA2 Pro Rotary Module. I hope you guys enjoyed this video, enjoyed all the examples, and hopefully learned something along the way. If you guys appreciate this kind of content, be sure to subscribe. I've got even more Xtool content coming, and specifically more F1 Ultra projects along the way. Be sure to check out my website, embracemaking.com, where you can find all of the upgrades and accessories shown in this video as well as always remember to check the video description down below for all of the relevant links. Thank you guys so much for watching. See you next time.